Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, we are exploring a fascinating and often misunderstood concept, insubordination. And I'm not talking about a coup, but principled insubordination. Insubordination that creates positive and maybe even necessary change. My guest is Dr. Todd Cashton, a world-renowned psychology professor at George Mason University and the best-selling author of The Art of Insubordination, How to Dissent and Defy Effectively. Dr. Cashton argues that embracing dissent and defiance when done authentically and for the right reasons, can lead to groundbreaking innovations and positive social change. Think about the civil rights movement or any other movement in the history of the world that created positive change but wasn't the norm. In this episode, he shares key strategies for expressing unpopular but important ideas, the four archetypes of insubordination, and intriguing insights on the role of courage in speaking truth to power. Get ready to challenge your assumptions about conformity and unlock the hidden potential of principled rebellion in your own life and work. But before we get started, take a moment and smash the subscribe button on whichever listening platform you are joining us from so you never miss another episode. All right, let's get right to it. So let's lean in and learn from the best. Todd, in your book, The Art of Insubordination, you kind of challenge this idea that typically we think somebody that's insubordinate is a problem, but you suggest that there's untapped value in embracing and permitting principled rebels. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. In some ways, for most of human history, from Copernicus to Galileo to Nelson Mandela, we viewed the dissenting voice in a community as, you must not care about this group. You must not care about whether we thrive. You're trying to break us and destroy everything we care about. And really recent social science work shows that there is a subset of dissenters that the motivation behind it is that we care about the vitality and longevity of the group. And that's why we disagree. We know we're going down the wrong path. And so we're going to point this out. And we need to hold this close to our heart when we hear someone that disagrees with the thing we care about because we might not recognize our own flaws and biases in our thinking. And that's what a dissenting voice does. So if you're one of these people that's trying to dissent for the right reasons, what is the most effective way to express an unpopular but important idea? So the number one most important strategy is to lose humility for a second, and you want to reveal that you are a member of the in-group. You are a committed member, and you want to list all the things that are behavioral evidence of why a good group member. I'm here for every single meeting. I am the one that took care of this person's retirement, this person's birthday party. You know that you see me in the office at seven o'clock a.m. every morning. We had that big merger. I was the one that stayed extra hours because I knew I wanted this thing to follow through. With all of this backdrop, I'm here to say, I think we're moving in the wrong direction. So put that up front and make sure that they can't classify you as you're really an outsider pretending to be an insider. That makes a lot of sense. But in order to do that, you have actually had to have done the thing. So it's kind of like you've had to have been a good teammate to start with. Right. You're just seen as a jerk. Yeah. I mean, look at sports, right? Kobe Bryant, who was an amazing player, but we can acknowledge that he was definitely high in narcissism, but the good side of narcissism. So one of the folklores of Kobe was that before a game started, he would get there about an hour before everybody else, and he would take up half of the court to practice before a game, which is pretty obnoxious when you consider it's a few dozen people are on the LA Lakers. They all make over a million dollars. And the idea was, I'm working harder. I'm putting more effort in. And when you match me, you'll get my side of the court and be divided to this side of the court. And so he always led by example. It was as if his narcissism was holding up a banner that said, I have these amazing strengths and I'm going to work hard to show that they are developed and that they're worthy of being broadcast to the world. When you can show that with behavioral evidence, then you get a seat at the table where people will elaborate your idea, even if it's disagreeing from the status quo. Yeah, Michael Jordan was the same way. Do you ever listen to the Founders podcast? No, never heard of it. 
Oh man, it is amazing. This guy basically breaks down all the best, like the greatest founders, athletes, and he goes through all their biographies and kind of condenses everything to the best notes. You would love this. And he gets information that most of us would never get because he actually then gets access sometimes for these biographies he's working on, these podcasts. But he's talking about Michael. And Michael is very much the same way that it was like the standard is all the way up here. And if you want to be on this team, there was one guy who was that was like a bench role player that had like hurt his hamstring and he was in the training room. And they had a practice that day and Michael is on the court and this guy's not on the court and he's a nobody. He goes into the training room. He's like, what the heck's going on? He goes, I hurt my hamstring. He goes, I played like 50 minutes last night and scored 30 something points. What are you talking about? And he flipped the table over with him on it. And the guy came out to practice and like hobbled his way through. And the point is like, everybody's important. Here's the standard. It's this high. And then when it's that high, you can like, if you got a, I guess, dissent, you can dissent. So something I thought was really interesting about your book is, can you explain what principled insubordination is versus destructive forms of disagreement? Yeah, there's a couple of elements. And I know of, of lots of listeners will think everything that they think and believe in falls under the principled category. Uh-huh. So a principled rebel, first of all, which is a fundamental importance, is this is an authentic to your values and your concerns about the group. So this is, What this means is you have to understand what does the group consist of? What's the composition? What are the ultimate objectives, the end game? And does this fit along with that mission? So as a counterexample of a non-principled rebellion, I often use of when the truckers blocked imports from coming in from the US into Canada. And so this was like a big thing that happened a couple of years ago. And The way that I described it, why it wasn't principled, was I understood you're trying to raise health insurance rates, you're trying to raise the salaries of truckers, but you have to think about what you're interfering with. What's the goal of a trucker? Get important things from point A to point B. So what first thing I thought about was pediatric hospitals, innocent children that aren't getting blood transfusions, pregnant women that aren't getting access to resources, doctors that are running out of resources. And when you think about this, Is what you're aiming for worth interfering with that? You move away from the principled aspect of what a trucker is. And so if you can make it strategically in terms of we're going to block the things you want, but you don't need, you're going to make an impact, but you're not, you're not going to get unnecessary detractors. So that interferes with the authenticity of the mission. And also is the other element of this is contribution. Are you doing this to improve the livelihood? of what your causes are and what your group can accomplish. And so if this is about your intellect, if this is about your athletic gifts, the Michael Jordans, the Kobe Bryants, is if it's to showcase just what you're made of as opposed to, I want the team to be optimized. Now you are moving away from principle to unprincipled rebellion. Yes, I love this equation that you have in the book. And then you talk about social pressure too. How does social pressure play into this? Yeah. So if you want to think of the equation, I know it's hard to do it verbally. You could think of it as nonconformity plus authenticity plus contribution. Those are the key elements. And then the denominator, the thing that is fighting against principled rebellions is social pressure. So once you put something out there publicly and it goes against the grain, it is not a conventional view in terms of 51% agree with you. You're going to get some friction. You're going to get some noise. And some people just like to do this just because either they're a bot or they want to make their own mark and put their own flag in the territory by themselves. As the social pressure increases, the pull is great to conform and act and think like everyone else. And what I would argue for is an arbitrary number. You only want 80% approval, no more. As soon as you get more than 80% likability in your Amazon rankings for your book or your for your CD or for your podcast, or your movie, I would say you probably didn't push the envelope enough, especially when it's art and science and athletics. You should be doing things that are challenging what's ever been done before because your unique DNA is unlike anyone else that ever walked the earth. Man, I love this. You talk about four archetypes in your book for insubordination. Can you kind of go through some of these archetypes? You have a quiz that we can point people to. Yeah. So the thing about a book is comes out a year after you start working on it. (laughs) So this is all extras. 
My favorite one of the archetypes, the one that I probably am, and I'm going to guess, Eric, you probably are as well, looking at your physical prowess, is the defender. And this is the person which is that there are certain rights, privileges, and values that I'm willing to put my physical well-being and possibly my life on the line. So I think of growing up in New York City on the subway in the 70s when it was really dangerous to be in New York City, especially as a 15-year-old and a 16-year-old. And one time I was taking the subway back from a, is it a Nick game or New York Rangers hockey game? And there was a guy in glasses with a large backpack, and he was going to everyone that fell asleep on the subway and going through their pockets, their purses, and nobody was saying boo. And I, was, I must have been 16 years old. I didn't want to say anything. But it was just like one person too many. And I was like, hey, guy, like, just leave the girl alone. It's like, she's not doing anything to you. He stops. He turns to me. I'm a nice little Jewish boy who reads scientific articles. I am not a fighter. And he's like, what are you going to do about it? And I said, listen, I can't defeat you, but I'm not going to stop talking. If it keeps you away from the lady, then I'm going to keep talking. And eventually enough people are like, leave the kid alone. So now it's leave the kid alone, leave the woman alone. And he just got pissed off and walked off the subway. Mm. That is the best possible outcome in that situation. That's the defender. Mm. I am defying the bystander effect. And that's basically a principled dissent in that moment. The thing in New York City is you don't get involved. You just look down and just don't get involved things. And that is a bad social norm. No question. It takes a lot of guts to do that. And I think people think I am a larger person. I'm six foot two, 200 pounds plus. But the way you made it sound is it's not the size of the person. It's like what you're standing up for that enables you to be a defender. Is that correct? Yeah, there's also, and I'm glad because actually you're even bigger than I thought. So I only got the size of your neck, which is the size of my torso. (laughs) Uh, We really underestimate the power of what's called strong social situations. I love this term in social psychology. A strong situation is one that the forces of how to behave are so potent that it overrides your personality. So you might be physically tough. You might identify as courageous. But if you're in a room full of people and nobody is saying anything, you are going to lean towards being silent, especially if your check and your finances is on the line. And if you're on the subway in the middle of the night and your physical welfare is on the line, you are inclined to follow the group and say, no one else is stepping in. Why am I going to risk a bloody nose or my own wallet being stolen from this person? And most people predict that they would be the whistleblower. They would speak up against corruption, that they would stand up to a bully and physically get in the way of them physically punching someone else. And then you watch what happens in reality. And there's like a 20 to 40% drop in terms of what you think you're going to do and what you actually do. And so it's really a beautiful thing. And we should celebrate when we see defenders. And we really don't have that mechanism in society other than the military, firefighters, police officers. Yeah. And that's their job. But that also calls a certain type of person out to take that job on. And, you know, sometimes the worst situations we see are when somebody is in a role that they're supposed to defend and they shrink back. And that makes people angry. And so that's the time, I guess, when you're supposed to be insubordinate, right? You're supposed to be the defender and you didn't do it. And that's like the problem. There's three other archetypes. Can you dig into those? Yeah. So the least common one that we think about, and I want to give a term for people, is what I call the niche carver. Hmm. You carve out your own niche in life that doesn't fit like everyone else. So the first thing that comes to mind for me is during COVID, a lot of people talked about van life, which is I like meeting people. I like traveling to new places, love hiking, love eating. And why should I have a stable household with a zip code in one spot? And so a lot of people decided that I'm going to be on the move. I've already graduated high school. I have a job. I can be mobile. Why would you possibly stay in Utah, in Illinois, in the suburbs of Levittown, in Long Island, New York, versus just be everywhere? And a lot of people responded of, you have so much privilege. You're so fortunate. You think you're better than everyone else. And this is the friction that you get, the social pressure, which is the proper way to behave in society is to have the picket fence, two and a half kids, and stay in one place. And these people said, that doesn't fit with my personality, interests, and lifestyle. And I think that it's very important of, if you're a polyamorous, not my thing, 
and you're not harming anyone and everyone is on the same board and it's ethical, all the more power to you. I don't need to hear about it, but enjoy your life. And I think what we're seeing is a lot of niche carver activity and people realizing I don't want to have kids. And I don't think that's even though it's my supposedly my Darwinian destiny, it's not for me. I just want to focus on making a real big impact with my career. I'm going to be a great aunt or uncle to all my friends' kids. And you they get pushback because you know that the idea of not having kids is not fulfilling your life. So that's an archetype. The other one that's really important about this is the culture shifter. And for me, this is my favorite president, possibly yours, Eric, as well, and many of listeners, is Teddy Roosevelt. And one of my hundreds of favorite moments of Teddy Roosevelt is 1904, he's deciding, do I invite the greatest education reformer in the United States to be the first black person invited to the White House? In 1904, this is a huge deal. Nobody invites black people to the White House. And so he knows his Southern relatives, they're going to disown him. He knows that his Southern backers for the second presidential campaign, they're going to reduce how much funds they give to that campaign. And he knows he's going to lose votes the entire South that happens there. And he had a civil rights advisor and the civil rights advisor had in their historical notes, something to the effect of this. Teddy said, because of the mental uprising that I experienced through the mere invitation of a black man to a meal, I knew exactly what I had to do. And it's based the idea, all of this social pressure for just downloading, wanting to download the brain of a great mind in America causes this much uproar. Clearly, I have to stop this and alter the culture and their thinking. Huh, that's so cool. It's also the right thing to do in that situation. But I love that, that it seems like there's a lot of courage that has to take place for somebody to do any of these things because it is so, I mean, have you dug into the courage component of this and where that comes from? Yeah, that's also, you can think of this as an equation. My co-author, Robert Biswas Diener, coined it where courage can be thought of as the willingness to take action despite the presence of fear. So fear is the denominator. And the willingness to act is the numerator. What I like about thinking about psychological conditions as equations is you can intervene two different ways. You want to either reduce the denominator, which is how do we better manage fear? And I know that you're into this with sports psychology. Or do we amplify the numerator, which is how do we get you willing to take action? How do we get you to take a step forward, even though all of your physiology is saying, stay in the same spot or take a step back and let someone else take the platform. And so if I want to decrease fear, we could focus on meditation. We can focus on treating your mental chatter, all that self-talk in your brain that's saying that you can't do something and realizing it's just like a stock ticker tape. It's always going to be producing information because your brain likes to be stay active and not neutral. And we're going to look at it objectively. If someone else had these same thoughts, how would we respond? Would we tell them, not to speak up? Will we tell them not to go into the arena and then mix martial arts? Will we tell them, don't get out of your car, let those two people have their accident and don't get involved? Or would we say to them, how could you sit there and not say any something? Do something. You know that you're skilled. Get into the octagon for the mixed martial arts battle that happens there. So these are strategies to reduce fear. And then if you want to increase willingness, the other part of courage, this is about what are you doing this for? What is the end game? Why would you go into your school and talk to a principal because you think that your child is being mistreated by a teacher? Not because you are a Karen and you want to basically, and you're overprotect your kids. It's because you think that the teacher is treating your child as if they're less intelligent than they actually are. And they are actually being denigrating to them. And this is tough, a difficult conversation. So what makes you act is, thinking about why do you have kids in the first place? What are the important values about having a kid? What is your role as a parent in terms of making sure they have the best environments possible so their potential can rise to the top? Thanks again for listening to the Blueprint Podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, we got two more coming with Dr. Cashton. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next two. And until next time, stay curious and keep chasing excellence.